Again, and uh, here to our Wednesday night Bible study here at uh, Solid Rock Church. I, uh, I pray that you're having a good evening. I pray that God's been good to you today, Lord. You're, you're so good to us when we, we don't even realize it. We thank you for that, Father. Uh, we're still in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 14, and we're going to throw verse 15 in there tonight. So I know you have your Bibles. If you'll turn to those scriptures, stand for the reading of God's Word when you find it, say amen, and we will get started tonight. And we will just give God praise, honor, and glory tonight. We will study His Word, which is truth. Amen? amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 and verse 15, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let us pray. Father, we praise you tonight, Lord, and we just humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Father, we thank you for all things. We thank you in all things. For God, we know that you're always with us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us, God, but you're constantly leading and guiding and directing our lives if we just believe in you and if we trust you and if we follow you. And we know, Father, that if we follow you and we allow you to guide us, that, Father, you're going to lead us and guide us along that path of righteousness. And I just pray, God, that you would bless us tonight as we study your word. Help us to understand it. Let it take root in our spirit. Let, us strength, let it strengthen our faith tonight, Father. <clears throat> and most of all tonight, Father, I pray, God, that it draw us closer to you by your spirit through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would just come and anoint me tonight to teach the Word of God, that you would speak through me, speak your words through the Holy Spirit and not mine, as I empty myself. And I ask that you would bless the people to hear and receive what the Word of God would say to them tonight. And I pray this, Father, in the precious and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen, amen. and Amen. Praise God. All right. We are studying spiritual warfare. We started out uh, and started moving into the, uh, the whole armor of God. Started talking about having our loins girt about with truth. We talked about having on the breastplate of righteousness. And I got most of that taken care of. There's a little more I want to cover tonight as far as the breastplate. And we talked about what righteousness actually was, that it was acting in accord with divine uh, uh, or, or uh, moral uh, or yeah, moral law, and that it, righteousness is actually free from guilt or sin. It's morally right or justifiable. It's a righteous decision. And that we are clothed in righteousness if we believe and have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And we talked about the breastplate and how it was fixed about our, one of our most vital organs. And that was what? That's our heart. It protects our heart. You know, the breastplate in, in, in the real world, in the Roman days, it, it protected the vital organs of the heart and the lungs. Because, you know, one shot from a piece of weaponry without the breastplate, in that area was a mortal wound. It was going to be probably sure death. And so Paul uses that as, um, uh, a piece of armor that we most definitely need because we need to have our hearts protected by the truth we need to be girded in the truth, our loins, but our breastplate needs to protect our heart or our innermost being. Spiritually speaking, our heart is our, our spirit, our innermost being. And so that definitely needs to be protected from the fiery darts of the wicked. Amen? Amen. Which is Satan himself. So, 
uh, you know, and I, and I got off on talking about some things about how that Satan has blurred the truth uh, and how he is using all these, these new things, these new ways to, to try to uh, dispute and um, to try to unravel what really is truth with all of, you know, uh, you just take, for instance, gender neutrality. I really talked about that last week because that's, that's such a big deal now. And all that is is just another way for Satan to try to destroy what the Word of God says. That's all, that's all it's about. It's trying to destroy and trying to deceive, bring deception into the minds of people that don't know the truth of the gospel. And it's not a new thing under the sun. It's been around. It's just, it's just a different way to try to change people's minds and to try to get them to question, question what truth really is. And if they don't know the Word of God, they already don't know what truth is because the Word of God, through Jesus Christ, is the truth. So tonight I want to... I want to go a little bit further into uh, having on the breastplate of righteousness and then, uh, and then we're going to try to move into having our feet shod in the gospel of peace. Amen. <clears throat> righteousness. We said that righteousness was being free from sin, is it not? But whose righteousness is it? is it? Is it righteousness of our own? When we're born again, we take on the righteousness of who? Of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's His righteousness. He just, once we accept Him as Savior, He is the one that He clothes us in righteousness, in His righteousness. In other words... We're wrapped up in His righteousness. We become one with Him because now when we're born again, we abide in Christ and, and Christ abides in us. And so as we abide in Him, He literally wraps us in His righteousness. He clothes us in His righteousness because we become what? We become one with Christ. Amen? We're no longer of ourselves. We have died to self and we become one in Christ. Amen? So the phrase, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, it proclaims the quality of righteousness as a breastplate. We're clothed in that breastplate. It's attached to us when we put on Jesus Christ, His righteousness. But only, but only we have to only have the right kind of righteousness. I want to make sure that everybody understands that. It's the righteousness of Christ. Amen? <clears throat> Our righteousness only comes through the Son. Amen? And this is the righteousness which is alone found in the finished work of Christ. Let's look at Romans 3.10. I'm going to list the scriptures over here on the right side like normal. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, none of us have any righteousness within ourselves. Only until we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, then do we have righteousness, and we have His righteousness unto God, because then we are clothed in His righteousness. And that scripture actually comes from Isaiah 41, 26. A lot of scripture that's in the New Testament was initially written or given to the prophets in the Old Testament. So that actually comes from Isaiah 41, 26 is where that originated from. Paul was just re repeating 
an Old Testament scripture. Isaiah said this, he said, Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know? And before time that we may say he is righteous. Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. In other words, there is none that is righteous. None that is righteous. Only Jesus Christ is the righteous. He's the only righteous one. And Paul was just repeating what Isaiah was spoken to him by the Holy Spirit. Our righteousness is only the righteousness of Christ. Let's look at Romans 3. Romans speaks a lot. Paul in in the book of Romans spoke a lot about righteousness. And I'm going to be referencing a lot of scripture out of Romans because that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about righteousness. So let's look at Romans 3, 19 through 26. Paul said here in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 26, he said, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. See, the law revealed to man what was sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Just exactly what I said. But now, but now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God, which is who? Jesus Christ. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets... Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Right there, right there, it tells us. It tells us that the righteousness only comes through what? Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Word says. It comes through faith. In Jesus Christ, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. Go ahead to 23, please. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right there, it tells us that none is righteous before God. Go on. Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, His righteousness, there it is right there, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Right there he is saying that our, our righteousness only comes from Jesus Christ through to them that believe. Only them that believe. It tells us plain right there. Only them that believe. I want to go back to another reference in Isaiah. Is it 11.5? Where this actually speaks of the righteousness of Christ. That's who Isaiah is speaking about here. He says, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And what Isaiah is talking about here, he's talking about Jesus Christ during the millennial reign. Which What is the millennial reign? Can anybody tell me? It's the thousand years of peace. 
It's after the rapture. It's after the tribulation. It's when Jesus comes back and destroys the Antichrist and his armies. And then we have a thousand years of peace. And God's going to renovate the earth. And we're going to have, and Satan is going to be cast into prison and into chains. And then after that, he's going to be loose for a little while. Why? I don't, under, I don't, I don't know. I, I wish he wasn't, but he is. To deceive once again for a little while, the Bible says. But for a thousand years, there's going to be peace on earth and goodwill towards men for 1,000 years. And that's called the millennial reign. And this is what it's referencing here too. That this, this verse presents Emmanuel or Jesus Christ as priest. And the loins here speaks of the physical, but with the rain speaking of the heart. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So the loin speaks of the physical, the rain speaks of the heart, and therefore the spiritual. For the first time the human family in Christ will witness perfection. In fact, the man, Christ Jesus, will be girded with perfection. And when everyone sees Jesus Christ, they will see him as he is, and they will see him in his perfection, and they will see him in his righteousness. Amen? <clears throat> so this is the righteousness which alone is found in the finished work of Christ. Once again, we have to go back where? Where do we have to go back to find the finished work of Christ? On the cross. Everything centers and revolves around the cross and the finished work that Christ did there. It was there that Jesus poured out his, out his life for us by the shedding of His blood, of His own blood, which satisfied the sin debt and the curse of the broken law. He was then buried and resurrected from the dead. He then presented a spotless righteousness to the Father and did so as a man, the man Christ Jesus. And upon faith... In what Jesus did there, the Lord awards the believing sinner a perfect, spotless righteousness. Amen? It's the righteousness that has, has bought and, and paid for at the cross. And the Lord can settle for no other. Amen? And then that's where Romans 3, 19 through 26 really... Uh, uh, sums up what I just said. That references, this what I just said, references that set of scripture I just read. <clears throat> if that is the righteousness on which we depend, it will definitely provide a breastplate of protection from the fiery darts of the enemy. However, if we do not properly understand the truth of the finished work, of the finished work, at the same time, we cannot properly understand God's perfect righteousness provided by the death and the resurrection of His Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the finished work. In fact, the church at present, most churches today have little knowledge of what I just spoke about, the finished work. Why? Because they don't talk about the blood they don't talk about the death. They don't talk about the crucifixion. They don't talk about the resurrection. They don't even talk about Jesus Christ in a lot of churches. So how in, how in the world can you talk about salvation or the finished work if you're leaving those things out? That's where a lot of churches are today. <clears throat> And consequently, the finished work of Christ is not enough, they think, but needs something added, which is done constantly. And as a result, it's just a dog and pony show, really is what it is. It's just a, it's just a social gathering. You know, if you, if you remember just a few weeks ago, I said, if you, get, if you get Jesus Christ wrong, it doesn't matter what else you get right. Because he's the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation that was laid, and everything else is built on top of that, spiritually speaking. Amen? So if we properly understand the cross and the resurrection, 
we will properly understand the righteousness which is afforded by Christ and obtain by our faith in Him. That's the only way we can have righteousness is through the finished work that He did and then believing by faith what He did do. Somebody just drove through. <clears throat> so, in fact, the whole world has to come to a decision as to whether they will accept the righteousness of Christ or righteousness of their own making and devising. The church falls into the same category. This has always been the great struggle in the church. That's to say, the righteousness of of Christ virtues the righteousness of man. It can't be done by works. It can only be done through faith. You'll find that in the book of James. You see, this is very important right here. The righteousness of Christ can be obtained only by our faith in the cross and the resurrection and what Jesus did there. Everybody understand that? When we say faith in that, we mean faith Totally in that, nowhere else, only in what Jesus did in the cross for us. In other words, faith must not be divided between the finished work of Christ and our own good works. Amen? Okay. So, let's read, let's look at Romans 10, 3 through 15. This is the scripture that I'm, passage that I'm talking about. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Amen? For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Who could do that? Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart, that is, the word of faith, the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, then what? Thou shalt be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. There it is right there. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. What is that? It's faith. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession. A lot of people are afraid of that work in the evangelical uh, world because when they hear the word confession, the first thing they think about is Catholicism. They think about confessing to a priest, but we're not confessing to anybody but Jesus Christ. We're confessing our faith in Him. Amen? you got to confess it before you can possess it. I'm just telling you now. you got to confess with your heart. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is Lord. Then once you confess it, then you possess your salvation. Amen? Okay, let's go on to 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. No respecter of persons, in other words. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Amen? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Enter in Brother Mike. And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now right there, it's talking about people that are spreading the gospel. Amen? But once again, Paul in Romans here is, is also doing another, another reference uh, from Isaiah. Let me see if I can find that. I have to flip my pages. <clears throat> that is Isaiah, an actual reference from Isaiah 52.7. It's not really a repeat. It really, what it is, is just, it's, it's actually prophecy in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, it's prophecy being fulfilled. The Old Testament is being prophecy proclaimed, and in the New Testament, it's prophecy being revealed or coming to pass. Amen? So Isaiah 50, 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now let me tell you something right here. Yes, it's the same words pretty much. But the words in the New Testament, the way that I understand it, is talking about the preachers or the men called of God to bring forth and share the gospel. But in the Old Testament, and, the, and it came from this, this passage of prophecy, but this passage of prophecy is actually talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the beautiful feet are those of the Messiah, not man, in this reference. Only His feet are beautiful. Only He uh, brings good tidings. And only He publishes peace. And only He publishes salvation. Man cannot do any of those things. They, that's where the righteousness of Christ comes in to man. When, when, when we have the righteousness of Christ, then we are able to operate in the Holy Spirit. And then we're able to preach the gospel and, and bring it to others and be a witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. But it all comes through the righteousness of Christ upon man. Am I making sense to you tonight? <clears throat> Any questions about righteousness? <clears throat> I think I got it pretty clear that what it is, where it comes from, and how it's obtained. That's the main thing we need to know, correct? Where it comes from and how it's obtained yeah. through faith. So let's, talk, let's, let's move on to, to uh, verse 15. Verse 15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen? <clears throat> What's important, why would you think Paul would, would, would want to talk about having our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace? Because no soldier can fight without their boots on they couldn't march very far they couldn't fight very well if they were going around barefooted because the Roman army traveled long distances in order to fight many of their wars so their feet had to be shod in a good sturdy type boot a leather boot that had a sole on it that would hold up to the weathering of, of the uh, the long journeys that they must travel and and the uh, and protecting their feet so that they could do what? Back to the, the old, so that they could stand. We're back to standing. No soldier can fight without sure footing. Proper shoes enable him 
to move forward in battle. Could you imagine if you had to fight barefooted and the other soldier had on boots or shoes or... I mean, all it would take is, you know, him stepping on your foot and already you're probably injured. You know, one, one, one strike from a spear or a sword and you lose your, your toes or half of your foot. <clears throat> and so this is a reference to the Christian that has to stand firmly on the foundation of what? We're standing on the foundation of what, did it say? The gospel of what? That's exactly right. The gospel of peace. And when our passage refers to the gospel of peace, it refers to specific kinds of peace. There's two kinds of peace. And I preached a message two or three times uh, on this in the past. And there's two types of peace. <clears throat> there is peace with God and there is peace of God. We're going to talk about having the peace, having peace with God. Because you can't have the peace of God without having peace with God. You understand me? You cannot have the peace of God if you do not have peace with God. You understand? <clears throat> so number one, let's talk about peace with God. Peace with God is positional. Peace with God is positional. What do you mean by that, Brother Mike? If you have peace with God, that tells you where your position in Christ is. That tells you where you're at in God. Amen? That's why, that's why it's called positional. Peace with God is... It's what we call positional peace, which can be compared to signing a treaty to end a war. Because before you came to Jesus Christ, you were at war with God. Whether you knew it or not, you were rebelling against God because your sin nature had to be defeated, had to be overcome by what? By the blood of Jesus Christ before you could be at peace with God. Amen? And though the treaty signals an end of the fighting, it does not necessarily end the conflict that caused it. In the same way, having peace with God means that by His grace, we have come into a right relationship with Him. Now, by accepting His Son, Jesus Christ, now we have peace with God. We are no longer at war with Him, but now we are one of His own. We have brought it, been brought into the kingdom of God. Amen? <clears throat> and our personal war against, against the rule and the kingdom of God has ended. Even so, we may still experience the turmoil and inner conflict that characterizes our old life. We, we haven't in, total, in, to, in totality removed everything of our old self. Yes, we're a new creature in Christ, but that's where our sanctification comes into play. Our progressive sanctification. We are continually changed day by day. And I, I don't know where that scripture is. I wish I would have wrote, wrote that down, but it talks about how it talks about how our old man is dead to self, but our new man is renewed day by day. I'll find that scripture and I'll, I'll read it the next Bible study. <clears throat> so let's look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. That's the scripture in a nutshell, but, but I want to know where to reference it out of the Bible and I'll look that up. I apologize for not having that tonight. 
Romans 5, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, being justified by, fa by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified by faith, it's positional. Now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, right there, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Can you say amen? amen? So that's why we need to have our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because now we have peace with God, and now we are standing in a position of grace with God. Amen? Woo! I don't know about y'all, that's good stuff. You see... Peace with God comes from the final surrender to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by that surrender reconciles you and me back to God the Father. Amen? He, we're reconciled. It's positional. We're, through faith, we're reconciled. There's another one of those words. Reconciled, what does that mean? Reconciled means that our relationship with God has once again been restored. Because when we were living in sin before we accepted Jesus Christ, we were dead in our sins, but we were also dead before God. Our relationship with God had been severed because of sin. Amen? And the only way to restore that right relationship was accepting Jesus Christ by faith. And once we did that, then we became reconciled back to God. In other words, our relationship was restored. So let's look at some scriptures about having peace with God, positional peace. Let's look at Romans 5.10. Making sense tonight? Praise God. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies, this is exactly what I just said. Now I'm going to show you the scripture. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Woo! Amen. Amen. So not only was our relationship restored, but our lives were also saved by the death of Jesus Christ and our belief in that death. So let's look at 2 Corinthians now, 5.18. We're still talking about peace with God. And all things are of God, all things. Not some, not a few, not one or two, but all things are of God. That's why people take it so, you know, people that are not living for Jesus Christ, sinners, unbelievers. They just take it for granted every morning when they, when they wake up and they, their feet hit the floor and they start breathing God's good, clean air. They just take it for granted. They don't realize that all things are of God. Even every breath that we take, we just take it for granted because we're just so used to it. But that's just the goodness and the, and the, the goodness of God. <clears throat> so all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So now we can, we can have a, a ministry to others and reckon, help reconcile them back to God because we've been reconciled to God. Everything that God does for us, He expects us to turn around and do to others. Right. Amen? Amen. He, he expects us to do the same thing. Right. He, you know, if no one would have ever told me about Jesus Christ, if I wouldn't have listened and heard a preacher tell me about Christ and the plan of salvation, I would have never been able to come to Christ. God had to draw me by the Spirit, but I also had to hear the Word of God, too. Amen? So is the same with every one of you. That's why 
We've been given that opportunity and we have to go out and share that same opportunity with others so that they have an opportunity to be saved. Let's look at one other, having the peace, having peace with God. And that's Colossians 1. Twenty-one through twenty-three. The Bible says, "And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable." and unreprovable in his sight. If, here's that big word again, if, if what? If ye continue in the faith. If ye continue in the faith. God's not going to make you continue in the faith. You have to continue in the faith. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's why we have to stand. <clears throat> if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Amen? Amen. I kind of like to move Paul's name, put my name in there, because I, I like knowing that I'm a minister of the gospel. Amen? Amen. So that tells us right there that, that we have to do our part. God has given us all the weaponry, but God is not going to do everything for us. And that's why a lot of Christians, especially young Christians, they fall away from their faith because they think God's going to do everything for them and when he don't, they just give up. They don't understand that they have to fight the good fight of faith. They have to not be moved away from what they believe and that's exactly what Satan's trying to do. I covered all that several weeks ago but I just want to reiterate that because it's plain right here in the scripture. Amen? Okay. So that's talking about uh, having peace with God, and it is positional. Now let's talk about the peace of God, because we have to put them in the right priority. We have to have peace with God. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. Once we have that peace with God, then we'll, then we'll be allowed to have the peace of God. And the peace of God is that inner Tranquility. You ever have those times when you're just going through a storm or you're going through a tough time and you just start praying or you, you get in God's Word and all of a sudden you just have that inner tranquility? You just feel, you just have a peace about everything? That's, that's the peace of God. That's the peace of God right there. When everything else is falling apart and falling down all around you, and yet God reassures you, He gives you that reassurance that everything's going to be all right. It's kind of like that song. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Whoa, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Whoa. Anyway, that's... That's, that's where it comes from. Amen? You just know that everything's going to be all right. That's the peace of God. Amen? Amen? Having that inner tranquility, it gives you... It gives you a sense of well-being. Having the peace of God gives you a sense of well-being you know that everything's going to be all right. <clears throat> Let's look at some scriptures to, to define that. And 
the thing that's really important here is to understand, because a lot of people, this is pretty simple stuff for a lot of people, and maybe a lot of you already know this, but there's people out there that, that couldn't tell you the difference of having peace with God or having the peace of God. That's why I'm taking time tonight to explain it. There might be one person out there that doesn't understand that. Romans 15, 13 tells us about the peace of God. All these other scriptures gave us reference about the peace with God. Romans 15, 13. Somebody find Romans 15, 33. Let y'all participate. Romans uh, 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Right there. Now the God of hope fill you with what? With all joy and peace in believing. Amen? Once you believe, now you have the, the peace of God. That ye may abound in hope. See, that's that, that hope. What is, what is hope? Hope is what I just said. It gives you that sense of well-being. You have that hope because you know that everything's going to be all right. Amen? Through what? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Who has Romans 15, 33? Anybody? There it is. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Who has Romans 16, 20? Somebody want to look that one up? Somebody find 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Who has Romans 16, 20? Amen. Amen. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Amen. When Satan's coming against us and doing everything that he can to move us away from our faith, the God of peace shall bruise his head. Amen? Amen. Somebody have 1 Corinthians 14, 33? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Amen. That's exactly right. For God is not the author of confusion. I think I, I used that as one of my devotionals last week. He's not the author of confusion. Satan is. God's the author of what? Peace. Through what, though? But, it, but where does it come from? It comes from truth. That's all right. That's good. He is the God of peace. But it comes through faith from the truth. Satan is the, is the author of, of confusion. God, through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the author of truth. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? Amen. So let's look at Colossians 3.15. This is the last scripture on, <clears throat> on this particular part. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Amen. It doesn't matter what is going on in our lives. If we'll let the peace of God rule over everything, we won't stress out over it. We won't worry about it. We won't let us, we, we, you won't have an anxiety attack over it. There's so many people out in this world that's, that's living with anxiety and, and they're not looking to God to help them to, to take care of it. They're looking to man and a prescription and drugs to help them with their anxiety. When a lot of it could be taken care of if they just had faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 
so we talked about having peace with God, but on the other hand, the peace of God is that it is that inner tranquility. It's that sense of well-being that transcends all of our circumstances. Doesn't matter what's going on, it rises above all of that. That's why Paul called it the peace that passeth that passes understanding. It makes no worldly sense to be at peace in the midst of chaos, but that is precisely the promise that we are offered in Scripture. Let's look at Philippians 4, 6 through 9. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. In, in other words, don't worry about anything. That's what he's saying. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. That's step one. Go back, please. That's step one. Be, be careful for nothing. In other words, he's saying, do not worry. Don't worry about what's going on in your life. Don't worry about your circumstances. Don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about your problems. Don't worry about your anxiety and all of that. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. The thing we need to realize when we read Scripture is that when there's instructional Scripture like there is right here, you've got to do step one before you can get step two. That's step one right there. And then if you do step one, verse 7 takes us into step two. If we do that, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Not only will it keep our hearts, our spirit at peace, but it's also going to give us a peace of mind. And that's, we need that just as much as we do in our spirit, because the battleground is against our mind. Amen? Let's go on to the next one. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, the Bible says to think on these things. If we'll think on these things right here, then we'll have the peace of God. Amen? It says right here, he says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That right there is telling us that the things that we learn, the things that we've received, the things that we have heard, we are supposed to go out there and share that with others. That's what it's saying. And if we do that, the peace of God will be with us as we do that. Amen? And I don't know about you, but man, I've had that exact thing happen to me. Been in the store or something and, and just felt led of the Holy Ghost to go and speak to somebody. And I did it not too long ago in Walmart and, and, and ended up praying with this young lady. And just as soon as it happened, man, you just, you just have this peace of God that just comes all over you just knowing you did exactly what God wanted you to. It just don't get any better than that in this life. Amen? So let me go back here, and we're going to finish up on the peace of God. <clears throat> and we're going to wind this thing up tonight. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Once again, we must define what type of gospel of which the apostles is speaking. Our feet... The phrase, our feet shod, speaks of our standing. It talks about our standing. Our standing is to be in Christ and in Christ alone. That's who we stand in, His righteousness, amen? amen. Which refers to what He did on the cross and the resurrection. One cannot take a firm stand if one is not standing on the right thing. That has to be on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen? 
And, and as well, one does not have the right type of shoes. We've got to have the right type of shoes. Paul has told us to stand, and we can do that only if we're standing firmly, and we can stand firmly only if we are on a proper foundation. And that foundation must be the finished work of Christ and that alone. Anything else is sinking sand. Amen? So preparation. The phrase with the preparation speaks of readiness, or it speaks of being prepared. Okay? And it actually speaks of assurance. So preparation speaks of readiness and being prepared. Being in readiness and being prepared. It actually speaks of assurance. If we're, if we're ready and if we're prepared, then we'll have that assurance. Amen? If one is trusting in oneself, there is no assurance. If we're depending on ourselves to make it through, we don't have any assurance. Consequently, there is no proper preparation, which means we're not standing on the proper foundation. Amen? That has to be Jesus Christ. Now the gospel of peace, the phrase of the gospel of peace proclaims the true gospel, which always brings peace to us as individuals. Amen? The true gospel. Peace can only come and can only be maintained if we are on sure ground. The only ground on which we can be sure is the foundation of the cross of Christ. And we must be firmly settled on that. If we are, then we have a deep peace within our hearts which knows nothing but victory. Amen? Because there is such thing as another gospel. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.4. Did I give you that one, Nish? You may not have that one. That's all right. I have it right here. The Bible says 2 Corinthians 11.4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. In other words, if you listen to another gospel, you accept a, a false spirit, a false doctrine, a false gospel, then you're going to have to bear with that. You're going to have to bear with that. Amen? In fact, the world is filled with such gospels. But these false gospels bring no peace as, as it should be obvious. There's no peace in a, full, in a false gospel or a false spirit. <clears throat> That's why Paul said to test the spirit to see if they're the true spirit of God. To see if they proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is only one true gospel, and it is the gospel preached by Paul, which in effect was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. For I am determined, this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. As long as we know that, we're on safe and sure ground. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> that's, our, that's our sure 
and solid foundation. <clears throat> Today we have the gospel of self-esteem, the gospel of humanistic psychology, the gospel of perverted faith, the gospel of greedy gain, the gospel of works, the gospel of self-righteousness, etc. In fact, there is no end to these false gospels. The prosperity message, that's a false gospel. Amen? Amen. Whereas there are many false gospels, there is only one true gospel as stated, and that's the, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if we'll have our feet shot in that preparation of the gospel of that peace, then we're on sure footing, we're on a sure and firm foundation, and we will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Anybody got any questions tonight? Anybody learn anything tonight? Praise God. Well, I'm going to end right there. If anybody has any questions, anybody's not sure of, of anything that I spoke about tonight, Anybody that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that's our number right there. You can call me. I'll be glad to share Jesus Christ with you, the plan of salvation. Pray the sinner's prayer. Be glad to answer any questions. Pray with you if you have a concern or question. Any way that I could help, my number is, is there and open. So if nobody has any questions, if nobody has anything else to say, You'll stand and I'll close us with prayer. <clears throat> I want to also say, if you don't have a, a church home at this time and you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you here at Solid Rock. Our Sunday morning services start at 1049 and 1045 and we do a Wednesday night Bible study at 630. If you have a church home, I want you to stay there and get fed the word of God, but maybe you're not going to church right now. Maybe you're just watching by the internet. I'd love for you to come and, and be part of our fellowship. We would love to have you and we'll show you the love of Christ. I can guarantee you that. And we'll share the word of God and Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Amen. So let's raise our hands for the blessing. Father, this is the blessing tonight, Lord, that we would be clothed in your righteousness. For there is no righteousness of our own that will help us in the kingdom of God. But I pray, Father, that we be clothed in the righteousness of your Son. And I also pray, God, that we will have our feet shod in the preparation of the gospel of peace, peace, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if we do that, then we will stand on a firm foundation and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which is in Jesus Christ. I pray this over each and every one tonight. We love you, Lord. We thank you, O God, for this time that we got to study your word and be in your spirit. And we thank you tonight, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you for being with us tonight.